All right, here we go. Elden Ring, the ultimate guide. Two years in the making. Now, the pacing of this is going to be lightning fast, so just please try and follow along as best as you can. However, if this is the first time you've watched any of our guides, I recommend you watch the video linked in the description. Now, I'm Gay for Games, my co-host is Twin Profanity, and he is going to be telling us why we're picking the Samurai class. So we're picking the Samurai class because it gives you access to early game bleed, as well as a bow and arrow, a tool that will be useful throughout the entirety of the playthrough. Now, the Fanged Imp Ashes we are taking instead of the Golden Seed and the Stone Sword Keys, because you get a surplus of both throughout the playthrough, meaning that by the end of the guide, they become irrelevant. The Fanged Imps you don't acquire until significantly later in the game than you can any of the other rewards, and they give you further access to early game bleed, making the early game bosses trivial. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they're easily the best summon that you can get in the game up until the Mimic tier, or overall for general use. Now, here we are at the first quote-unquote boss of the game. This is a, a classic Souls-like boss where it's considered to be a sort of you're supposed to lose to it. Now, if you do beat it, and the Samurai class is actually quite good at that because it does do bleed damage, you get the what from it again? You get the Ornamental Straight Swords and I think the Beast Crest Shield? Now, we do okay. come back later in the game to kill that thing anyway, so just die to it. Now, when you die to it, you'll be transported here, and you'll be given your red flask and blue flask. Now, what we're doing here is that we're resting this grace, and we are um, using our blue flask and moving it into our red flask. That just gives us four heals as opposed to three heals and one mana heal. Uh, because currently, at this point in the game, the, the heals are better than the mana heal. We're not using a lot of our mana for our spells and abilities, so... It's just better to get the healing at this point in the game. Now, this is essentially like the tutorial area of the game, I guess you could say. Um, if you, this is the first time you're playing the game, there'll be a bunch of tutorial messages like popping up on screen. Uh, so obviously, you can just kind of use that to get accustomed with the controls and stuff like that. We don't need to tell you that. But otherwise, this bit is uh, pretty straightforward. I don't think you're going to be having any any real issues with it. Really, the only reason we're going through this, and you'll see this after we beat the quote-unquote boss of this area, is following this, you get access to the strength gesture, um, which you would otherwise miss if you chose to skip the tutorial cave. If it's not your first time playing the game, and you're just using this guide as a refresher, or you're just watching it for the entertainment value, you can just skip this cave. It's not, it's not mandatory. You don't get anything especially valuable from it. Yeah, no, absolutely not, but... As this gate, this guide rather, is going to be covering everything, we do pick up, pick up every item other than like a few consumable, uh, crafted items rather, and which are pretty much irrelevant. So the strength gesture is indeed like a key item, so we're going to be picking it up. So this is the first boss of the game, intensely easy. Uh, you can just use this as a, as to get accustomed to yourself and try to like fish for backstabs and things like that, but as you can see, it's just a normal guy with basically a health bar on the bottom of the screen, so it's... It's not exactly uh it's not exactly rocket science at this part of the game so i think you i think you'll be fine if you're having if you're having problems with this part of the game probably go play a different game to be quite honest but moving on uh we now we're just at the bit we got teleported to so we're just above the hole that we jumped down we can go through this door and to our right is the fringe folk heroes grave that we were speaking about now this if you picked the stone sword keys you could put them in that imp statue there and it will open the fog gate and you can go to that area however that area is definitely well it's not definitely but we consider it to be too high a level for this point in the game and we come back there at a much more appropriate level yeah for sure i mean it'd give you access to one of the better casting seals in the game it would give you access to an early golden seed there are some good rewards in there but we will get them at the end of limgrave now exiting into limgrave you're going to encounter the first npc in the game that'd be white mask vare now his quest spans a large portion of the game taking you all the way into the second major area leonia and you'll come here you'll talk to him a couple of times you'll get a gesture from him you'll speak to him um after you defeat the major area boss for Lingrave, and then he will move to Leonia, and you can progress his quest from there. But for now, we're just grabbing this. Um, this item, the one that was just outside of Fringe Folk Hero's Grave, and the first item you pick up in the game are all multiplayer items. They're, once again, not required for the single-player experience, but since this is the ultimate guide, we are going to be collecting all of them. Now we're grabbing the Golden Rune outside of the Church of LA, and then 
progressing on to the gate front. We're also um, just avoiding the big scary guy on the horse. We come back and we fight him, so don't worry. Do not bang your head fighting him. It is not worth it. Um, a lot of this guide involves tackling things at an appropriate time. Now, some of this guide is also sped up. Again, just not to waste your time, but again, it does keep the pace up very quickly. So just follow where we are going, pick up that item at the little, little camp that we picked up at, and now we are at Gatefront Ruins. Now again, we're going to be just avoiding a bunch of enemies by running past them. This is definitely something that you should learn that you can utilise. We're grabbing the map fragment there, because it, we find it's very important to just pick these things up as quickly as possible. Um, so it just save a little bit of time. We're grabbing it, and we're just running up to this grace, and when we rest at the grace, it is going to despawn the enemies chasing us. As you can see, a bunch of them are chasing after us the now. But you can use this technique to your advantage, and it's good to just explain it's not worth fighting everything in the game, and you will see that as we play the game. Now, this is uh, Melina. Melina, yes. <laughs> um, Melina is your firekeeper equivalent for the game. She's with you throughout. She levels you up, um, <clears throat> and she's going to give you the spectral steed whistle that allows you to summon torrent, the, uh, the spectral steed. That's your main way of getting around the map. Now, we're putting the Spectral Steed on our little quick access menu that you can access by holding in triangle and pressing one of the directional buttons. Now, if you press L3, you can go into your crouch slash stealth mode, whatever you want to call it. And this lets you get backstabs on enemies a little bit easier. Um, their awareness of you is lowered, I suppose you could say. Now, opening that, we get the uh, Lord, Sw Lord Sworn's Greatsword, is that what that says? can't remember, but yeah, that's right. there's an item there. Now, again, we're just going to highlight the um, the stealth in the game. It doesn't come up too often. When it does, it is useful. You can experiment with it a little bit more than us, but we definitely have techniques and routes through the game that doesn't really utilize the stealth all that much because, frankly, stealth and crafting aren't massively relevant in the game. They're good when they're good, and they're kind of meh when they're just not really using it. Because a lot of the game, you can't use the stealth. So... In this case, you can, though, and you can kind of use it to, like, not get swarmed by all these fucking enemies. Because if you do get spotted by the enemies, they'll alert the other ones and they'll all come chasing after you. So, again, we're just running past a bunch of enemies here. We get on torrent, and we're just going to run down this flight of stairs here. Uh, the enemies won't chase you down here for whatever fucking reason. Uh, so, thanks for that. Love that for us. But, in this chest here is very important because it has... Uh, the wet the the whetstone knife, which lets us upgrade our weapons, uh, or uh, and then also the um, storm stomp ash of war, which is uh, extremely useful. Uh, you'll see why later on. Hi there, Ed and Tony here. So after going over this video, it appears that we did forget one thing. That being, you should be picking up as many items off the floor as possible because all these items are crafting items. So the game has a bunch of flowers and bugs and various other shite that you can pick up off the ground like any other item, except it doesn't show up as the item orb. You have to be like standing near the flower or whatever it is that you're picking up, but it will come up with a prompt. So you can just spam triangle wherever you're going and you'll just hoover up whatever's close by. Now, even though you can pretty much ignore crafting for the entire game, and even though it doesn't come up that much, it still does come up now and then, and you'll be glad that you did it. So ultimately, it's a good habit to get into by just spamming triangle whenever you're moving over the world map, because you will pick up useful crafting items, as well as some not useful crafting items. So again, just heading past all these enemies, and there's another random grace here for some reason. Like, this is... Just seems very close for two graces. But we are going to pass the time here, because you can do that in the game. We're going to pass the time in the morning, because there's a bridge up ahead, and if it's at night time, there'll be a harder enemy on the bridge, and we want to avoid it, so we're making it morning. That'll despawn that enemy. And the next thing we're going to be doing is talking to the NPC, Bok, who is hiding in a bush around here. So you can hear him shouting at you, and um, once you hit this bush, he will show up. Now, what does he do? Bok the Seamster, as the name suggests, will allow you to modify your armor sets. It usually just involves taking a cloak off or putting one on, and it will increase the weight and increase the defenses, or decrease the weight and decrease the defenses, depending on which option you choose. Box quest um, starts with him giving you 10 mushrooms, progresses to a cave somewhere in Liv, then further on, pretty much follows you all the way through Leonia, onto Altus, into the um, capital city, and 
from there his quest pretty much ends, but we will address that as and when it pops up. Yeah, so we're just going to kill these three guys here because you'll see the, you'll see why it'll be an it would be an issue if we didn't, right? But you can see there's a magical scarab thing here, right? Now, if you approach it from the ball side, it can't see you, which is why we kind of took that long angle, like that wide angle around it. If you approached it from the scarab side, um, it would see you and start running away. So you can use the crouching to actually get around it easier to the ball side, and then that stops them running away. Now, it's a bit awkward to do that for every scarab, but with that one, it's just kind of a good example of showing that you can do it. And we do it later on, and for a bunch of other scarabs as well. So following the path along, we picked up a golden rune on a little rune. We're heading down this uh, kind of the beaten path onto this uh, next grace. And then again, we are following up to this rune, which is Kenneth Hate. And what does he do? Kenneth Height is the owner of the fort of the same name in this area. He's recruiting you to go clear out Godric's Knight Captain, who's taken it over. Um, when you do, you'll be rewarded with the Bloody Slash Ash of War from that NPC. We'll cover that when it pops up. You will also be rewarded with the Erdsteel Dagger when you speak to Kenneth again, and then Kenneth becomes completely irrelevant until way later in the game when it comes to finishing Nefeli Lu's quest, whom, again, we'll meet later on in Limgrave. Now, from here, we're coming to the first of many mass graves. These usually contain a bunch of consumable golden runes, and in this instance, it also contains the first of many cookbooks, which contain crafting recipes. Now, as Tony said earlier, crafting is largely irrelevant. It does up very often, but when it does, it usually has a drug impact on what you're using it for, and that book in specific has the sleep pot recipe, which will trivialize a pair of irritating bosses that pop up a few times throughout the playthrough. Yeah, so like when it comes to crafting, as you said, a lot of the time it's like somewhat irrelevant. Like you can do cool stuff with it, but like you really could, you could go the entire game without ever using it. But again, uh, there's just certain strategies that are so powerful with certain crafted items that you can't buy or find elsewhere that it is worthwhile, obviously, using those strategies if and when they come up. So we're going down these um, like gravestones that are embedded in the side of the wall. If we drop down to the bear, there is a smith and stone too. So we're going to pick that up and avoid the bear and the wolves as much as possible and then follow the river along up until we get to this hill. Now here's another scarab, which again, we're taking a wide angle around and we are going to approach it from the ball side. Again, it ain't going to run because it's a pain in the ass when it runs because you need to like chase after it and keep hitting it and yada yada when you can just use Unsheath that does a whole bunch of damage to it and just kill it in one. Now this drops Sacred Blade, which is almost a key item, to be honest. It is so fucking good. Um, it's just a general buff to your weapon, but it does insane amounts of damage to like a bunch of certain enemies, mostly undead enemies. And it also stops skeletons respawning when you hit them and where your blade is buffed with Sacred Blade. And that is like just a huge weight off the mind, you know? You kill them in one hit and then they stop respawning. So yeah, Sacred Blade is basically almost a necessary pickup. And now we are going to the first church of Marika, which has another bunch of fucking uh, extremely important items. So it has uh, the, the third class. church of Marika. <laughs> oh, sorry, the third, sorry, Jesus. So it has the sacred tier, the physic flask and a cracked tier. Now, when you rest at this grace melina will show up again you can speak to her now while we're speaking to her i'm going to explain the physic flask the physic flask is essentially like your red or blue flasks but you get to customize what the effect is um the crystal tier items are um what you put in the physic flask to change its effect currently we have the restore half hp one there's a whole bunch of them in the game there's about 20 different effects and you can put two into the flask to get a a multitude of a combination of different effects. So it's a really good item. Obviously, you want to pick that up. It's basically integral to the game. We also picked up a sacred tier. Now, like earlier in the game where we you, we upgraded our flask uh, by moving the, the blue flask to the red, we can use a sacred tier to increase how much health or how much mana we get back from the red or blue flask. So here we are moving into the Mistwood. We're going to pick up this next map fragment. Now, there is an item next to a bear there. We will get that later, don't worry. And to our left, uh, which you see there, um, that kind of, th this building right there, that is a lift that leads down into an underground area. Again, we'll tackle that later. It'll be relevant when we get to it. And here, we're picking up some more crack tiers. This is more effects for the uh, physic flask. So, obviously, pick them up. 
And now we are coming up to Aslam. Now, how good is Aslam? So Aslam is a contender for probably the most uh, useful Asher War in the game. Um, generally useful, I'll say. It's good versus crowds. It's good versus anything smaller than you. Because if it's smaller than you, Aslam will flatten it. It does a not, massive not amount all the of time. stance damage. A lot of enemies that will Mo also flatten it are bigger than you as well. This is true. This is true. The other contender would be Lion's Claw, something you get significantly later. And throughout the course of this playthrough, we came to the realization that Arslam is generally good versus crowds, where Lion's Claw is generally good versus single targets. Now, we're coming up to the first of many, many merchants throughout the game, and we're going to be buying the Blue Gold Kite Shield, probably the third best, if not second best, shield in the medium shield category. Now, this is due to its stability to weight ratio as well as its defenses. Um, the only ones better than it, arguably, are the brass shield, which would drop off of any of the soldier enemies carrying that, um, or the twin bird kite shield, which we do eventually switch to later in the game. That shield on its own effectively gives you the effect of two of the talismans in the game for an item that you're wearing on your back. So instead of having four talisman slots, you'd effectively have six. Yeah, so it's pretty good. Uh, also, at that merchant, we he had two cookbooks in the inventory. We will be picking them up in due course. Don't worry. So now we are warping back to the third church of Marika. And now we are going to go to the round table hold. This is the quickest way you can do it. Um, effectively, if you rest at a site of grace outside of Limegrave, you will indeed be... Um, Melina will show up and she'll take you to the round table hold. Now, this... Portal will take you to a much, much later area uh, called Dragon Barrow. Now, in this building, there is a guy called uh, Garank, and you can trade death root items with him for spells and abilities. Uh, but we're not going to deal with him just now. However, you can uh, touch this site of grace. Do not rest at this site of grace. And the reason for that is if you rest at it, it will reset this guy's aggro. So he will start attacking you if you run past him. However, if you uh, just grab the Sight of Grace, uh, he will leave you alone. Because you transported here via the teleporter thing. Now we're running down here. We picked up the Golden Seed. Hopefully you noticed that. And when we rest at this Grace, Melina shows up. And Melina will transport us to the Round Table Hold. Now, while I catch my breath, you can explain who all the NPCs are. Jesus Christ. So, the first and most important NPC we're going to talk to at Roundtable is Gideon, but before we do that, I think it's important to talk a little bit about what Roundtable actually is. It's your central hub, akin to the Hunter's Dream from Bloodborne. It's where you would upgrade your weapons, your spirit ashes, there's a few merchants, and it's tied to a lot of NPC quests. Speaking of, so Gideon off near the All-Knowing is tied to a bunch of NPC quests throughout the game. He gives you four items, all of which you will obtain way later on, so don't worry about those now. You do, however, need to worry about talking to him, because otherwise his quest can't progress. We just spoke to Dialos, his quest spans the majority of the game, but we'll talk about it when it's relevant. After that, we spoke to D. D is tied to Garank. Uh, who we touched on briefly but didn't really interact with. We'll talk about him when he becomes relevant. We spoke to Corin, who gave you the prayer gesture, sells you early game miracles. We talked to Ensha, who gives you the what do you want gesture. And now we're at the Twin Maiden Husks, the merchant for the area. We pop some runes, do so if you need to, and we're going to buy a dagger. So the Twin Maiden Husks is, I guess, the sort of generic merchant of this area. Uh, some enemies, if you kill them, will drop a, a bell-bearing item. You can give the bell-bearing to her, and she'll then sell their items. Now, that guy we just spoke to there was uh, Hugh. He is the uh, like the smithing guy, like the Andre equivalent. He'll upgrade your weapons if you have the, uh, the, the runes and the materials. But for now, we don't, but we will come back to him, so don't worry about that. Now, we upgraded our flask there using the golden seeds that we've picked up so far. And now we are putting Storm Stomp on the dagger. Now we just essentially use the dagger as a sort of like um, bidoof of the game, if you will. We just put uh, <laughs> a bunch of different Ashes of War on it to just use it as a uh, just a kit, just to get. It. We just use it for the Ash of War, not the dagger. Now we are warping back to Church of Ele from the uh, Round Table Hold, and when you do that, you will um, Rani will show up and she will give you the Spirit Column Bell and the Lone Wolf Ashes. Uh, now, you use the spell at Spirit Column Bell, if it's in your inventory, you can then summon the Ashes. Now, we already have the Fanged Imp Ashes, which are far better than anything we're going to get for a while. So, now, we are going to speak to Kali, 
And I think from here we're going to buy a few things off him because we have uh, some uh, runes that we can sell for money, I guess. Don't know what else you'd call it. And we are going to buy a bunch of key items. So we're going to buy the telescope. Then we're going to buy the crafting kit. Now the crafting kit is what gives you access to the crafting menu. And then we're going to buy the three cookbooks in his inventory. He also has three crack pots in his inventory, which we're going to buy later, but you use them to craft throwable items, such as fire pots. So you need the pot and the materials that go in the pot. Um, now we're leveling up to 15 vigor and 15 endurance, but something we should explain about the pots is that when you craft an item and use a pot, it doesn't take up the, you don't, like, it will re, the pots will reset. So if you use five pots and have five throwable items, once you've thrown those five items, you still have five pots left over, right? The game never explains this. I went through the entire first playthrough without knowing this, so probably best to just explain that. But the pots will become more relevant as we use them through the game, so you'll then pick up on that. So now we've uh, warped back to uh, Gatefront, and um, don't let whatever the fuck is happening right now happen, okay? Try and avoid these enemies. Don't get stomped by the giant, right? Let's, uh, <laughs> don't, don't do that. <laughs> From here, we're going up the hill, running away from the giant and all the enemies that just caused you a bunch of trouble. We're going to grab a golden seed at the top of this slope and then head off to the second of the many, many mass graves that are laying around the place. There we'll get a bunch more runes. We will be picking up some smithing stones somewhere in this area. Uh, yeah, so there's this little uh, circle of something with some smithing stones. Now, that's three smithing stone ones, so that's actually quite an important pickup. But further ahead is the uh, the mass grave. Now we're just going to speed this up because it's literally just golden runes and nothing else. So we're just going to pick that up. Fuck it. Like um, there's a bunch of bats. Kill the bats. Fuck them. Like ignore them. Don't ignore them. They're not going to be a problem. But the biggest problem actually is controlling torrent trying to pick these fucking items up. Actually, but moving back the way, this is now over the gorge that we kind of ran through past the giants and stuff. There's like a kind of, this, it's like a rune that has fell over the top to kind of create a sort of bridge. There's another golden rune 2 item there, which is barely worth picking up, but, you know, we have to show you for the guide. But running all the way around the gorge to the bottom and the other side, uh, hopefully you can understand what the fuck I'm talking about. But there is a... Um, Kind of like a kind of like a, a gate type thing, and we're going to show you why ground slam is so fucking good. So it does good damage, and also you saw that we pancake this guy. Now, pancake is like the best stats effect in the game because if an enemy is on the ground, guess what they're not doing? They're not fucking attacking you, are they? So not only is it like aggressive, it's also defensive as well, which is why storm, uh, but like ass slam, ground slam is so good. It also does a whole bunch of poise damage, so it will stagger enemies that lich, and then you can go for a critical hit. Not only that, you can pretty much put Aslam on basically everything, so it's generically useful for pretty much every weapon, almost. On top of that as well, the, the actual animation of uh, Ground Slam lowers the hitbox of the player, so if an enemy has primarily horizontal side-to-side -side attacks, um, occasionally they will just go over your head. So it also sort of functions as a, as a dodge. And on top of that, yes, Aslam keeps getting better. It also has an AoE, so if multiple enemies get caught in the radius, they will all get pancaked. So what you just uh, we saw... We just picked up a gesture there, as well yeah, as we... the... Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> um, we just picked up a gesture there, um, as well as a Starlight Shard. Now, those are able to be consumed to give you FP back, but what we're going to use them for is as a currency. So for the love of God, don't spend any of them. Yeah, and also just remember to pick up that gesture on top of the little ruin. Now here we are at Rodriguez Shack. Here we're going to pick up a stone sword key. Uh, that is one of the items that we spoke about earlier that lets you get into the that, that kind of hidden early game area. Now if you speak to Rodrika, she'll give you the sitting sideways pose, but keep speaking to her. Now it's very important that for the NPCs you keep speaking to them until they start repeating their dialogue. Keep speaking to Rodrika, and she'll give you the spirit jellyfish ashes. Now that is actually pretty good, but again, it's nowhere near as good as the Fang Dimps ashes, because the Fang Dimps, uh, they, they're, they're fast, they, they dodge attacks, they do bleed damage, which means that their damage output is far beyond what most other spirit ashes are at this part of the game. They also are like, I mean, they're not the like the tankiest, but they, they take like okay damage. But heading east, we get to the Warmaster Shack, and this guy, so pick up those fire arrows, because uh, 
fire arrows are good, by the way. But at the War Master Shack, this guy sells a bunch of Ashes of War. Now, um, you can buy them and experiment with them and just have fun. Something we will encourage is have fun with Ashes of War. They're the most fun part of the game, I think, and you can experiment a lot with them. But um, there's none that we use specifically for the guide, except from the Ash of War No Skill, which you can put on your shield, which means that instead of the parry, you will use the Ash of War that is on your right-hand weapon, which means you can have your shield out to block and just immediately spam out the Ash of War on your right hand. So that's, like, very, very good. Um, I don't tend to parry a lot in this game when the Ashes of War are just generally better than that. Now, we also picked up some more Golden Seeds, which means we were able to add another charge to the Flask. Go us. And um, here we're putting on the No Skill. So, uh, I think we might demonstrate it. Yep. So, with the Shield out, immediately we're using the Ground Slam. Uh, so, that's very, very useful. Warping back to Rodrika's Shack, we're going to head off to the, the west now and follow in this kind of cliff edge around. So in this next area, we're going to be grabbing some important items. First of which is going to be some crafting materials. Those are great for upgrading your weapon. Uh, there's also a magic grease. There's some blood roses. And importantly, there is another spirit ash. These being the Godric Soldier's ashes. Now, they fill a similar niche to the Fanged Imps in that there are two of them. But where the Fanged Imps are better in terms of their DPS, they uh, can inflict bleed where the Godric Soldiers cannot. Um, they do both have range damage, but the Godric Soldiers have a better time breaking enemy poise. They also have a lot more health so that they can withstand a lot more damage than the Fanged Imps can in general. Now, following this, we're going to drop off the edge and head up the hill to grab the next Scarab, which, Tony, if you want to explain what's in there. Yeah, so the next Scarab, actually, it has something called Wild Strikes. Now, as you can see, we're just speeding up this hill. But in this Scarab is Wild Strikes, and now we are using the Katanas currently, but we do switch to using Great Hammers later in the game, and that is when we use Wild Strikes. Now, Wild Strikes on a big heavy weapon like that will completely trivialize every NPC fight in the game, so any literally just another human character kind of enemy. Wild Strikes is absolutely the best thing that you can use against them. Uh, and there's a couple of somewhat difficult NPCs, and this will completely trivialize them. So if you take away anything from this video, it is that. Now, we're just grabbing this grace here. Now, following up this tunnel is the first, like, main major boss of the game. But we're just grabbing this grace now to warp back to it later as a time save. We're not doing that boss until, like, part three or four. And uh, now we're just heading under this kind of, like, this, like, under the bridge, essentially. And up this little rock is a hidden, uh, I think it's a lump of flesh? It is, which I think is a crafting item, question mark. Correct, yeah. No, nice, um, nice. the lump of flesh is a crafting item, so missing that doesn't really matter. You get plenty of them. Uh, coming along to the end of this broken bridge, you're going to pick up the next crafting book, and a little bit further down is another scarab. You can sneak up on this one the same as you can the others, or you can take it out with the bow, which I think is what we're going to do. Aye, we're just using the bow to essentially show that you can use the bow against these scarabs. Now, I'm accidentally using the fire arrows to kill these things. Don't do that, just use the normal arrows, because the fire arrows are way too valuable to use at this point in the game. Uh, they're more useful in Stormvale, and they're kind of rare to get at this stage, so yeah, just use normal arrows. Now, heading up this side mountain path to Lyurnia, this will auto-complete Rodrika's quest, moving her to the round table hold. And then effectively from there, we can get her to upgrade her Spirit Ashes. So that's why we're coming here, along with the fact that you can also get a Sacred Tear in this little chapel coming up. Um, so it's definitely worthwhile coming here because there's effectively zero resistance to do so. There's no enemies to fight. I think there might be a couple of wolves that we ran past. But anyway, that's us picked up a Sacred Tear and that's Thops there that was sitting next to us. Now, we're not going to talk to him. Uh, he, but We will speak to him later on in the game. Just ignore him for now. So now we're actually back in round table hold. We can now speak to Rodrika and Hug to get her to move to her final spot, which will then allow her to upgrade our spirit ashes. So when Rodrika moves to the round table hold, she will become Rodrika the spirit tuner and she will upgrade your spirit ashes like Godric Soldiers, the Fanged Imps, the Mimic Tier, the only one that matters. Um, and the way that you get her to do that is by talking to her, talk to Hugh, talk to her, talk to Hugh, and eventually she'll be sat opposite him and 
you can use the glove war items, the ghost and grave glove warts that you find in catacombs to upgrade. There she is. Um, we don't have the ability to do that yet, but we now have access to do that. Following this, we're going to talk to Hugh, and we're going to... What are we going to do, Tony? What are we going to do and what are we not going to do? We are going to upgrade the katana. What we are not going to do is upgrade the fucking dagger. Now, this caused a huge amount of pain in the ass for us because we had to go into cheat engine and do a whole bunch of shit. But do not do what we are doing currently. Do not do this. Instead, go along in the menu a little bit and upgrade the katana. Do not upgrade the fucking dagger, okay? Now, once you've upgraded the katana, we're going to warp back to Stormhill. Uh, and... We can upgrade our, uh, you can just, you should probably have upgraded your flask, by the way. You have, we have the option to do so. But there's a golden seed here, um, and that is because Rodrika moved to um, be in the spirit tuner. So once she does that, there's a golden seed. And we can use that to upgrade the flask, as you just saw there. And then from now, there, be, oh, go on. To be, I was going to say, to be clear, um, you would otherwise have gotten that golden seed directly from Rodrika. Um, by doing her quest the normal way, which you would complete inside Stormville, but because we went to Leonia early, it auto-completed, so you get the Golden Seed early. Correct, correct. Now, from all that, though, we're going to warp back to Cali, uh, or the Church of Ellie, rather, and we're going to sell all the runes we have, and we are going to upgrade our Vigor and our Endurance. Now, the first thing we're trying to do is get to 20 Vigor and 20 Endurance. That is the, uh, the first step in our leveling up journey. Um... And here is the final stats of part one. And that is it for part one. We are, uh, you're perfectly set up for the rest of the game. So there we have it. That was part one of Elden Ring, the ultimate guide. It finally happened. I told you it was going to happen eventually. Special thanks go out to Halvatron, Captain Sharky for doing the thumbnails, who you should check out our Instagram. It's linked in the description. And also Twin Profanity. Cannot thank him enough. I don't really think this guide could even have really been able to have happened if it wasn't for his help. And yet, last of all, if you made it this far, then clearly you must be enjoying what we're doing. So you can check us out on Twitch and Twitter, which is the two main places we're going to be. Fuck Facebook, who's just fucking using that anymore. And if you want to help support the channel, then you can fling a few quid our way on Patreon. But the best thing you can do is just give this video a like and just comment literally anything, please. But with that, part two, we're still in Limegrave. And we'll be seeing you there.